In this video, I'm going to unpack the complexity of the large range of models that we see within Yamaha. And to help simplify matters, I've drafted the help of the YAS280, the YAS62, and the YAS875EX custom model. Now it can get really complex when we're doing comparisons like this. So in order to break this down and make it as simple and as digestible as possible, I'm going to take each aspect and demo little bits and pieces as we go along. I'm going to look at different aspects of design, aesthetics, ergonomics, sound and playability. And ultimately, hopefully answer the question, who are these instruments for? Okay, in this first demonstration, I'm gonna play each of the three saxophones, and I want you to specifically listen out just for the intonation. Now you might expect me to turn around now and say that the intonation on the 280 is so good and on the 62 it's slightly better and on the 875 it is the best. But in fact the answer is that there is no difference between the three of them. Perhaps marginally so on the 875 and I'll get onto this later. The 875 uses a different neck and that has um, some slight intonation implications. But the point here is that Yamaha employ a technique called top-down manufacturing, which is where they put all of the R&D into their top models. So in this case, the 875, and they take that understanding, that technology, and they drip feed it down into those lower models, the 62, the 480, which we're not reviewing today, but that's that intermediate one, and the one we're looking at today, the 280. So in other words, if you buy a 280, you get the benefits of all of that R&D that goes into the 875, and you get this perfect intonation. Okay, so next up, I'm going to try and demonstrate the softer end of the dynamic range. So I'm gonna play a soft phrase, um, as identical as possible on each of the three models. Okay, so purely just in terms of this test that I've just done, what I feel happening is that with all of the instruments, they all have slightly different response fields. The 280 uh, responds very immediately and, and has a nice centered warm sound, all of the things that we've heard over the years that the 280 does. It is a really pleasant sound. But as we just move through the others, through the 62 first of all, I find that the sound just takes on a bit more gravitas and breadth. 
And then finally onto the 875, it has that same breadth, but it's sort of almost expanded on even more. There's a sort of silky quality in there. Um, it feels just a bit more exquisite and expansive again. And as you go back to the 280, as I've done in the, in the days gone by, I really do hear that difference. And you can really particularly hear it in this quiet playing exercise I've just done. That resistance thing that I just mentioned, um, I feel that I just need to push through the sound a little bit more in order to get it moving with the 875. And I'm going to come on to that later on. In fact, I'll explain the reasons behind why I think we're getting these differentials later. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so next up, I'm going to play something with a bit more edge. I'm going to push more air through the instrument. It's going to have a harder sound and we'll see what differences we can hear now. <laughs> So what I found happening there is that as we move through the range onto the 62 and the 875 and we push more air through the instrument and go for a more powerful sound, that sort of breadth of sound that I mentioned with the quieter side of things is retained a bit more on the 62 and particularly on the 875. It's almost like the instrument can handle that amount of air in a better way. On the 280, it very easily accelerates into to loud playing because it's a uh, such a light instrument, I'll come on to that later, but it's almost like the sound just thins out a little bit on the 280 when we really push the sound, whereas on the 62 and the 875, this extra um, breadth of sound just remains in the sound there. Um, so it's really interesting to hear those differences on the quiet end versus the, the loud side of things, that you can hear those differentials as we move through the dynamic ranges. Okay, next I'd like to talk about the weight of each instrument. So the Yaz 280, and I put this on the scales earlier, actually weighs 2.32 kilograms. The 62 is 2.45 kilograms, and the 875VX is 2.5 kilograms. So what does this tell us? Well, in the context of the alto saxophone in general, I should tell you that the 280 is very light. It's on the serious light side of the scale. And what is causing this and what effect does this weight difference have? Well, when we move from the 280 to the 62 and then the 875, the 62 and the 875 have a strapping system. So we've got these straps of brass running up and down the entire length of the instrument um, onto which the posts are then soldered. So it adds, adds this sort of extra um, solidity of build, if you like. And it's a common practice uh, with many um, sort of professional level instruments, if you like. But also with the 62 and the 875, they're made from a different brass, um, a, a more premium brass with a heavier gauge. And this is accounting for the majority of the weight difference. Um, there are some other peripheral things that may make a little difference, uh, but they are not uh, the sort of majority factor, as it were. The traditional thinking is that adding more weight can bring a denser and fuller sound to the build. Uh, but in fact, there's some brands who've gone the other way recently and they've gone for lighter builds so they get more of a free blowing effect. But back to the 280, as it's already one of the lightest instruments on the market, um, the 62 and the 875, when you put it in that context, are kind of perhaps more normal weights, as it were. And with the 280 being so light, what this means is that as we push the air through the instrument, it just responds so quickly and effortlessly. And in this sense, it makes it very suitable uh, for beginners who perhaps don't have that same air capacity as more advanced players, where the 62 and the 875 can come into their own. And just on this point of the having the lighter build on the 280, the interesting thing about it is that it really picks up the air very easily at those quieter dynamics, as, as we've already demonstrated. But when we really push it to the max, you
you can kind of hear the sound thinning out and almost ultra compressing on the 280. Whereas on the 62 and the 875, we don't get this effect so much. Let's talk about the key layout on the three instruments. Now, prior to recording this video, I thought I'd do some measuring just to see if there were any differences at all, because it was my assertion when I just initially picked these instruments up that they felt pretty much identical and the measuring tape would back that up because there was really hardly any differences. In fact, on the 280, you might expect the, the hand shapes to be a little smaller because you might have heard it banded about that the 280 is the kind of beginner's sax, more geared towards children and all the rest of it. And so you might expect the hand positions to just be a little bit closer. But no, they are the same as the 875. But as I say, there's a slight difference on the right hand where in fact, actually the key spacing is slightly further apart, only by a few millimeters, but it's neither here nor there. Uh, but again, I'm going to come back to this point of top-down manufacturing because the 280 again receives the benefits of what they've done with the higher models in the sense that they've put so much R&D into getting perfect ergonomics and key spacing in the 875. And they use this top-down manufacturing method where they apply all those same benefits and key spacings and all the rest of it to the, the models that come before it, in this case, the 280 and the 62. One feature that I've admired over the years with Yamaha saxophones is the quality of their neck receivers. And it's the same throughout the range, the 280 up to the, the 875 and the other instruments as well. This is the 875 neck receiver. And I tell you what, it's such a satisfying thing putting the neck into the body and knowing that it just fits absolutely perfect. There's none of this kind of bumping it around and trying to get it into place. Uh, once you've once you've placed it in, you get this nice zinging sound, which I really love. Uh, it might sound bizarre, but uh, for me, it's just the little things in life that keep me going. And then I tighten up the neck screw and it holds its position absolutely perfectly. And I wouldn't normally recommend this, but um, I've got the safety of my lap here. I can actually pick it up by the neck and it locks into position, which you don't get on many brands of saxophone, um, which just goes to show the quality and the close tolerances involved in this piece of technology. And we all know how important it is to have this connection um, super well manufactured and tight in terms of the tolerances because we're passing air from the neck into the body and we don't want to lose any energy at this point. Well, earlier I explained the different tonalities that we were getting between the three different instruments. And I said I'd explain why we're getting these differences later on. Well, it mainly comes down to the brass, the quality of the brass, and in addition, this strapping, which adds this extra weight to the instrument. That is a large part of it, but another equally large part of it, which I touched on earlier when I mentioned that the 875 has this special neck, so we have the V1 neck on the 875, and this is a hand-finished custom neck that really does have a big influence on the sound. And I proved this to myself by taking the, the neck, the V1 neck on the 875 and trying it on the 280. And I got a kind of halfway house sound between the 280 and the 875, just showing how fundamental the effect of the neck is. But when you combine all of these factors together and then some other factors in terms of the component tree and the mechanism that is slapped onto the outside of the sax, it's the net effect of all of these things that gives us this um, extra quality and all of these performance aspects that I've already mentioned on the 875-62 series compared to the 280. And finally, just to mention some finishing touches and the aesthetic side of things. It's pretty clear that with the 875, which I have here, it looks like um, a perhaps a more attractive instrument. We've got this very obvious engraving here. And uh, with the neck receiver, I've mentioned it, but this is made from a sturdy and nickel silver material over and above the slightly lighter material on the 280, albeit it's still an excellent neck receiver, as I've mentioned. Um, but also we've got other things that just need to be taken into account, such as the use of the higher quality Pisoni pads, 
The ergonomics, albeit that they are the same as mentioned with this top-down manufacturing method, we do just get some extra sort of optimizations with the 875, some extra curvature going on, for example, on the octave key and various other keys that just make the sort of connection to the sax player that little bit more sumptuous. So it's the sum of all these extra things that just give you that slightly more um, kind of exquisite feeling and experience when we're playing on the 875. Okay, so now to answer the question, who is each sax for? Well, as alluded to along the way, the YS280 is very obviously a student instrument, but due to the fact that it's of such excellent quality, can really take you beyond that. So you could be a student for many years on this instrument and receive still plenty of benefit from the instrument. As we move on to the YAS62, this is a real solid workhorse of really a, what I would call an entry professional saxophone. So you could play this on a professional basis. It has the solidity and the weight of sound and the sort of rigor of build to carry you through in many a professional situation. And really just if we build on top of that with the 875, the extra advantages of the sort of exquisiteness of tone that I've mentioned just take you to that extra level. If you take the saxophone playing really seriously and you want to have the absolute best within the Yamaha framework, the 875 really does stand out. As well as the 82Z as a model I've not reviewed today, but that is the sort of um, pairing alongside the 875. And it should be mentioned also that on the 875, we just have this extra quality of componentry, which does allow the player a bit more longevity in terms of how long the saxophone is going to last between services, something that could be of real importance if you are a gigging professional musician.